Thanks for tuning in to the Move Mind podcast. My guest on this episode is Dave Allenson, strength and conditioning coach for Foundations Performance. Um, Dave, thanks for coming on the show, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to this one, going into some cool ideas and topics. So for those uh, that are listening and watching and don't know your background, you started your sort of professional career, as I understand, as a history teacher and then after putting some yeah, years into that gave it up for the strength and conditioning world and I wondered if you could maybe yeah just shed a bit of light on what it was like to sort of qualify as a teacher and go into that world and then make the change over to S&C. Yeah um, yeah to be fair I absolutely love teaching um, it was brilliant loads of people the first question that they asked me is oh was it because the kids like no not at all the kids were brilliant it was um, I worked at a school in Nottingham. Uh, we got offsteaded. It felt like a bit of a hit job and we got academised. And then I moved uh, after that to a school in Rotherham that was a bit closer to home because commuting an hour each way sucked. Um, and then the same thing happened again a few years later. Um, and by that point, I was just done. I, I stuck around. I saw what was coming. I could see the writing on the wall. Um, I was further along in my career progression. so um sorry career progression I was further along in my career so I was earning a little bit more money and it was becoming clear that if you weren't going out of your way to justify exactly why you got paid what you did which was as much work as actually just doing the job um that you were going to be have your pay reduced and kind of slowly be pushed out if you were too expensive because on the traditional model each year you got a bit more money the idea being you were more experienced and you're probably taking on a bit more responsibility um i won't go into all the details of how academies work but the simplest way to save money as an academy is to pay teachers less um and that's how you make profits as an academy and it meant that if you're further up that pay scale like the, the normal teacher one not if you're like a head of department or anything like that um it makes sense to try and pay less and push you out if you can because it's much cheaper to hire a new person um wow so yeah that was <laughs> yeah and to be fair it's not every academy there are plenty that have done it really well a lot of people really early adopters of the academy model um saw the writing on the wall early and went right well if we do this to ourselves we can control the model that, that we're in um i worked in two schools where they kind of hoped this would all blow over and eventually had the, the model pushed upon them. So it was a much more aggressive model than a lot of schools used. But yeah, for me, I was I was just done. Um, it was the politics of it. And I basically just decided if, if I'm going to have to work for dickheads, then I'd rather that dickhead was me. Absolutely. Because at, at least if there's, if there's structural problems or um, things getting in the way of me doing my job, then it's my fault so I can actually do something about them rather than being stuck in a situation where someone's asking you you know why why didn't the kids do as well as you wanted them to and you want to say well because you changed how many hours I get with them each week and then they say well that's irrelevant and just pretend you haven't said that and then measure you on on how it's your fault rather than taking any kind of share of the responsibility but is what it is yeah, so I guess for the international listeners that are, are tuning into this, the Ofsted, um, the Ofsted, as I understand it, is like an ex inspection, right? It's like a school inspection. Is that the kind of yeah, yeah way it works? And it was because of that then the school, they felt the pressure then, did they, to change their sort of... Uh, no. So what actually happens is if you fail an Ofsted inspection hard enough, they can force you to become an academy. And essentially the entire process is removed from your hands. Um, at one school... We didn't get the worst category, but the headmaster that they didn't like had just stepped down. Um, so the the rumour there was that we got a slightly better category because they were trying to get rid of that headmaster. Um, and then at the second place, we got the worst possible category you could get, which was ironic because we'd been told by the... Um, the government essentially like the department for education told us that our results were good ofsted came in with exactly the same data and told us that our um our results were absolutely unacceptable and we were failing the community and then partners that partnered us up with a school that um year on year got worse results than us but held them up as a pinnacle of education it, it, 
it, it beggars belief. By the end of it, I basically felt like I was being gaslit by my bosses and their bosses. Right. Not in my department. My department was wonderful, but I, I just I couldn't cope with the cognitive dissonance that I was supposed to accept and just sit there going, am I going insane? And talking to the other people in my department, we're like, are we all going mad? Like, what's going on here? Wow. Um, so, yeah, for, for me, that was enough. And I just thought, I need to go and do something that doesn't make me feel this way anymore. And my wife basically gave me the ultimatum of you either put up or shut up. Right. So you either need to do something else or you need to stop complaining. And I thought, well, I'm not going to stop complaining about it because it doesn't feel right. Yeah. So I'll do something else. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? When something's off and you have a gut feeling that it's off, what comes out of your mouth, whether you're ex- talking about that it's off or not, is complaints. It's just, yes. there, there is the signal. And anyone that's remotely intelligent yeah. in that department will understand that something is is wrong. Yeah, and I don't think it's healthy to be in a work environment where you're uh, either no. complaining at the environment or holding your tongue at the environment and then letting it all out when you get home. It's not. That's not conducive. So how did you come across the sort of world of strength and conditioning then? Because it's quite a sharp turn from the classroom yeah. setting, the historical kind of syllabus now into, yeah, barbells, plates and sort of squat racks. Um, I'd always been interested. Uh, I played rugby at university and in my, I think it was my final year at school. Um, one of our coaches encouraged us to go and use the gym because we played against a few. So I, I went to a private school in Surrey. Um, which is ironic considering I worked in two state schools in the north, but um, well, Nottinghamshire and then the north. Um, and we were playing against high level scholarship schools that were just, and this was like 2002, 2005, 2006, they were starting to adopt a bit of an SNC model. It was probably all quite misdirected because I know that only in the last five to 10 years have they really started to figure out what they're actually doing in that area. But our school was well behind the times. We had none of that. Like I, I've just seen that my old school was advertised for a um, a high performance intern to come and do the strength and conditioning for their sevens team because they've been really, really successful. And I thought like we didn't even play sevens. Like wow. our, our coaching was okay, but we'd turn up at certain schools and they would just put 50 points on us. And we were just sat around going, what the fuck just happened there? Like I remember teams of lads where they'd have – they'd have a decent team and then they just have this one kid who looked like a man and ran like a mutant. And you just thought, yeah. what, what am I, you know, your coach would be screaming at you to tackle them and you just look at them and go, no, no, I, I'm not being run into by a man who weighs three times what I do. Yeah. Um, passing himself off as a 16 year old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, we, um, we had a little bit of that. Our coaches encourage us to go and use the gym at like the local YMCA. And the fact that I became very, very quickly aware of having absolutely no idea what I was doing and having no one to turn to, um, I was lucky enough to know through a forum, someone who was a power lifter in America and had played a little bit of um, rugby in, in uh, college level. So he pointed me towards some decent websites. Uh, I remember like reading Elite FTS and stuff like that when I was sort of 18, 19, dreaming about conjugate um, wishing I could low bar back squat like these power lifters and all that sort of nonsense and got interested in it at uni again because they had a slightly better gym but the, the situation was still the same it just toyed with it I basically did 531 for years back when Jim Wendler first released it um yeah yeah then stopped playing rugby well sorry before I stopped playing rugby I built the garage gym because I was sick of sitting around waiting for equipment and I played rugby at uni and a lot of the people that I used to play with still use the gym. Right. So being a teacher, I had very little time to go and use the gym. I didn't have an hour to sit there waiting to use equipment because six people that you used to play rugby with were trying to talk to you. Um, it sounds a bit mercenary, but I just, I, I didn't have it. So I was fortunate enough to be able to build the garage gym. Didn't play rugby for a couple of years because of uh, some, some stuff that happened with teaching that meant I really needed to concentrate on what I was doing at work. And uh, basically after that year off, my wife just said, please don't go back to rugby. Like you, um, you make more sense. You can remember stuff better. So with hindsight, I probably took far too many low level knocks, never been knocked out. Um, prized the fact that I seemed to have quite a hard head. If I ever did knock heads with anyone, they came off worse and I just walked away from it feeling fine with hindsight 
I know some of the evidence suggests that that's maybe possibly slightly worse, but right. it is what it is. And that was when I, oh, this is a very long winded story, but you trained with one of my best friends from school, um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and he got into MMA when we were just finishing off university. And I got into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu then, then stopped playing, then carried on playing rugby. And then when I f- finished rugby, I was like, I need to replace this with something else. I can't, I can't not do anything. Yeah. I went back to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from there. And after a couple of years, realized I'm in bits, everything hurts. I need to start lifting. Didn't know where to turn and went to Will Whalen at Powering Through to work remotely with him because I'd been reading his stuff since about 2010, I think. Yeah, um, through Scramble blogs and the like. Yeah, the through the days. Scramble blog. And then ironically, it turns out uh, he's. Sis, his little sister did her PGCE with me in Nottingham. No way. <laughs> it's just such a weird. Really? <laughs> well, that's bizarre, isn't world. it? Yeah, yeah that yeah, is bizarre. Yeah. Okay, so you started under with like, with Will then. Yeah, brilliant. Wow, what yeah. a great first source of sort of knowledge to go to as a standing yeah. point. Most people sort of learn from a bunch of shit sources first, don't they? And then realize, ah, oh, that was all shit. And then they find a decent <laughs> sort of mentor or coach later on. But Okay, so that was your your introduction. Well, what a great starting point. And did you notice then corporally that you felt better from the oh, jiu-jitsu, yeah. from lifting? Almost immediately. I, I, was, um, I actually started working with him. I'd already considered it, but the turning point was um, we wanted to do a marathon for charity because my, my uncle had got very ill and, and died quite suddenly and been looked after by a hospice. We wanted to raise money for them. Um, and I basically realised I, was I wasn't going to survive the marathon training if I didn't do something alongside like the first week I think my knees felt like absolute shit and I just thought no I can't figure out how to do my programming around this I'll pay someone else to do it and I'd already been doing a couple of wills um he'd released some of his stuff about GPP and things and I'd kind of been figuring it out for myself and experimenting and then just thought I'll just work with the guy who actually knows what he's doing yeah (laughs) smart yeah especially if you've got the home home gym set up yeah, I, th- I I had assumed you had done the home gym as a result of COVID because that was, was sort of the reignition of home gyms and that was the case in my my life and that was yeah. really shone the light on how important it was to have your own setup if you could. But it seems like you were miles ahead of the curve then. I suppose up north you've got a lot more space, have you? Where you can have a garage and more room than you probably could down in. You'd uh... be surprised actually. We I, I think I did my wife's head in. We were looking for a house saying it had to have a garage that I could turn into at least part of it into a gym yeah and it sounds like you know like the dream of those big American it isn't at all um the the reason all my videos are basically done from the same angle is because that's the only angle where it that it, fits yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah where I can totally. actually fit them in. yeah um so there's enough room to do quite a lot and it's forced me to innovate but it, it's space is the one thing that's lacking like we can't even really do farmers walks there's not enough room we have to do marches and stuff like that so there's some downsides but um covid was when i i really heavily invested in making it look a lot more professional we kind of went from there and, it, and adapted it as we went but yeah i bought the bare bones of all of it years ago just because i wanted to train by myself <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, on that note, then that segues quite well into my next sort of question for you is must haves for the home gym slash home garage gym setup. If you had to tell people, you know, crash course is what you got to do if you want to install your own setup. What would you say is the kind of must haves there, whether you're coaching somebody out of your gym or for your own training? Um, So in terms of bang for your buck, you the month where you want to spend the money is on a decent barbell and a decent squat rack there's a lot more options now than when i bought it i bought a power cage because basically everything everything else was shite essentially yeah. um now there's all sorts of options you can get some fold away racks you can if i was to do it over again i'd probably still buy a, a power cage but um yeah uh, uh, something decent in that respect and then a good bar like i bought a texas power bar i know now everyone looks down on them and wants Ohio power bars from Rogue and there's loads of different options now that mean the, the quality of barbell has gone up as well but again when I was buying it was Texas power bar or you really were hit and miss in terms of what you would get um yeah because the other stuff you can buy really easily like plate weight who cares don't buy it new buy it second hand off Facebook marketplace you can you can pick up some absolute deals like if, if you're paying more than two pound per kilo 
I think you're getting ripped off. Um, again, if you've got the money, you've got the budget and you're putting in a big order for like a, a, a commercial or boutique gym, absolutely go for that. Like I would love to have little thin powerlifting plates, but it's not, it's not on the, not on the horizon at the minute, but yeah. Um, an, an adjustable bench if you can, but one yeah. that's wide enough that you can use it for bench press. Um, some kind of pull-up bar. If you get a power cage, they're usually attached. Depends how tall your gym, your garage is. So yeah. for me, my garage is quite low. I had to buy quite a low, um, low height. At the time, Strength Shop were the only group that offered a low height power rack. So that's why right. I've got theirs. Um, you, kettlebells are pretty cheap again. You could get a couple of them. Really, though, I think I think the main thing is a bar and some weight because you're going to want to drive stimulus, and that's the simplest way to do it. Um, the kind of best investments I've had since then have been parallettes. I watched what a lot of Chris Mia doing that with his boxers. Bought them, thought, well, I'll take a punt, see what I, I think of them. I really rate them. I think they're I think they're excellent for push ups. Um, I've got some older female clients, and it's been a really nice entry point for them because. Yeah push-ups aren't there i don't have my my dumbbell handles are like loadable dumbbell handles so they're pretty big and unwieldy for for everyone um and then a ramp that's i'd say that's actually one of the best things that i've bought is a little squat ramp okay just got a little rubber one um but just making it easier for people to get past all of their worries about squats like if, if someone squats like shit put them on a ramp get them to hold a weight at arm's length Boom, that solves 99% of people's issues with squats. Um, yeah, fascinating. Just the counterweight and jacking the heels up a bit. Yeah. 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 And then people get a feel for it. And I mean, people worry about this too much. Like, do you need flat shoes? Do you know? I, I don't care. If they're moving, that's all that really matters to me, anyway. Um, and then after that, I got a trap bar. Okay. And that was worth it. Uh, I got a rogue. Uh, no, I didn't get a rogue one. Don't, I was going to say, don't get the rogue one because then you're pretending about how heavy you can trap bar deadlift because the handles come up to like your mid thigh. So, yeah, um, that's one that Will taught me is if anyone's setting records on a rogue um, trap bar, you can take a good, well, I don't know, like 10% off what they're suggesting because actually, <laughs> range of motion so small. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas a lot of the, the ones you can get hold of in England are generally a bit smaller. Right. Um, okay. But yeah. Solid. Yeah, it's a solid setup, right? I mean, if the barbell slash trap bar is king of overload, I mean, that's where you're going to start. And we yeah. learned that the hard way in COVID lockdown time. It's like everyone that trained hard missed the barbell access because that was the yeah. one thing that got the the most overload. And there's a reason why it's so classic and universal, I guess, right? It's just, it hasn't really been redesigned it's the same kind of idea more or less yeah, yeah. it works yeah fantastic Definitely. okay well, that is a nice little crash course then on the the home gym setup and i mean how have you found it working for yourself and not being like you know you being responsible like you said for your own complaints if you have any rather than feeling like you have to stuff them down because of institutional politics yeah. um i've enjoyed it i think i've probably it's a double-edged sword because I probably find it too easy to relax and step away from things a little bit, which I know a lot of other coaches struggle the other way where they do too much and try and get into that sort of American. Um, the thing that gets satirized now is like the, the Sigma male grind set. Like, oh, I've got to optimize my time. I've got to make sure that I'm getting most out of my time. I must meditate so that I get all that. I'm just fuck off. Like none of that's ever interested me. I, I the, the little part of my like knobhead ego just immediately rails against that. It's like, no, don't want to do that. Um, and I just think that it's probably a downside for me. I need to, I have to set myself deadlines so that I'll actually sit and do a bit of deep work that will get me somewhere. But at the same time, I won't obsess over stuff in the yeah. way that I know some, some coaches find difficult. And I think that comes from the classroom experience because I've already been through that process where you try and micromanage everything. And you slowly realize the stuff that actually matters and the things that you've wasted your time on grinding out that made you a worse teacher because you were too tired to actually be any good when you were in the room. Um, so 
yeah it's kind of like leaving leaving your like uh leaving your work at work and learning how to do that but then not ignoring it completely that you forget what your job is kind of thing yeah okay yeah a more of a yeah a bit more of a balance but I, yeah i can imagine the stress levels would be a lot lower when you're not having to deal with politics that is the beauty of being so. yeah i mean there's, the stresses are just different because it's yeah. a case of how much you're earning um yeah. like i'm always the, the, the huge disadvantage of training people think like training out of the garage is this whenever i mention it i'm always surprised that other coaches are like ah, oh, yeah that's what i'd like to do like, i'd love that setup what you forget is you have got no marketing you've got no influx of new clients and all of those things that it can be easier to take for granted in a larger gym just dry up um like it, i've had to that sorry that was going to make me sound like a like a self-made man which is another fallacy i don't agree with but you you have to make the effort to market you have to make the effort to try and build a network um and that's been slow but it's been helpful so the the main thing i try and focus on is like how good is the delivery for my clients so that i get referrals yeah. but eventually referrals dry up unless you're in a very specific niche with a very specific group of athletes there's only so many people that you can train so you you have to make the effort to make sure that people know about you like i imagine around here in walkley hardly anyone knows where i am or that i exist yeah. um which was part of the reason why i wrote the course because i needed something else for income that wasn't just coaching so that i i had a few a few different options but yeah it, it's it's trading one thing for another but the stresses of of it being my responsibility are an awful lot nicer than having to yeah manage up with someone that i know doesn't care and won't listen and doesn't understand yeah absolutely yeah there's there's the uh the challenge of the the garage style is there's no footfall like you were kind of alluding to there right people don't just yeah. walk past and go oh that's nice it's like they don't know don't know oh, you no exist. neighbors walk past looking at what is he doing? you haven't you can yeah. you can see your neighbor through yeah, <laughs> yeah, so yeah what can. is all this metal work? in the summer with the with the thing up it's amazing you just watch as like like anyone just walks past and like what are you doing yeah fascinating so, or oh, maybe there's a there's a conversation point there to be had then if it's like morning you know smile yeah. on your face. <laughs> it's not a sex dungeon don't worry <laughs> <laughs> it looks like one but I promise. yeah yeah solid okay and so you were saying then earlier dave like through your rugby it was a sort of bouncing between rugby and jiu-jitsu how did you start your jiu-jitsu journey um was that through uni as well no so i my friend jim who you've trained with was getting into mma he was living down in nottingham at uni um he just started his, his housemates i think had got him into watching some of the ufcs and then he got me into that and then when we were home over the summer holidays, we decided to see if there was anywhere to train nearby and found, uh, I think it was called Extreme Martial Arts. And that's where Martin, the jiu-jitsu coach at your jiu-jitsu gym, used to, or head coach, sorry, used to train out of when he was a purple belt. Right. And I went along with Jim because we had nothing better to do. It was the summer holidays. And um, I went in as a, like, 95 kilo probably probably fat than that probably about 100 kilo of like beer um thinking oh, i'll be fine i've done contact sport before and then martin who at the time was still vegan was about 50 kilos wet through absolutely ruined me and i just sat there going oh awesome this is cool there's something to this um then kind of went back to rugby because i went back to uni but never really lost remembering that I really enjoyed that. Jim did right. a couple of MMA fights um, and then eventually decided that he just wanted to do jiu-jitsu. And off the back of that, it was always in the back of my mind. And then obviously when I stopped doing rugby, I had a look around Sheffield and found there was a, a gym down in Hillsborough and just went from there. It was like 10 minutes from where I live. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And got very lucky that the guys that I'd uh, found had the set a really similar sense of humor very like similar to your place basically yeah that approach and so it's a good training was, environment i was going to say do you reckon that was one of the attractions then the training environment and then also the fact that some <laughs> skinny skinny ex-vegan just basically took you for a ride and it was like wow yeah, that yeah. was bizarre it's it engages your attention doesn't it yeah a hundred percent and it, well either that or you never come back yeah i think i think that's a defining moment because i was sat there with a grin on my face and yeah, same thing again when I went back to it. I got absolutely wrecked by it. Because so I was just trying to go forwards through everyone. Because that's yeah. what you did in rugby. Yeah, rocking, yeah. And they were all just laughing as they were beating me up. And then afterwards, I was just sat there grinning. 
and I remember like being told later on by people that I trained with, they're like, yeah, we thought you were fucking mental because you just you you just did the wrong thing constantly, but were happy as anything at the end of the session after we'd like choked you to bits. And I just liked the fact that all the pressure was off. I could just sit and learn. It didn't didn't matter. I wasn't I think by the end of playing a very low <laughs> level of rugby, I put a lot of pressure on myself. Okay. Um, and that was gone with jiu-jitsu. I could just go and enjoy it. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And it's great that you, it stuck with you enough for you to want to go back. It's a unique yeah. experience for most people that stick with it. I think most people can understand that they had some sort of residual memory about their first time and it just stuck with them for better yeah. or worse and that they wanted to continue whatever that line of inquiry was. Um, I want to pick your brains then a bit, Dave, on the sort of the jujitsu landscape and then I want to get into the navigating grey area stuff because that's yeah. really where the exciting chats are. But I also think that you've got some really interesting ideas around sort of learning and the landscape in, in jujitsu. And I know we've had some interesting sort of back and forth around this idea. I wonder if you could just maybe give your two cents on what you think like the current learning landscape is like in jujitsu and sort of like the average academy class setting and maybe what could be improved about the way that it's taught if, if, if anything does need improving. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of caveat the whole thing by saying I, I am a four stripe blue belt and I haven't taught anyone. So <laughs> take that as it is. But on the other hand, teaching and learning is teaching and learning. I don't think there is any, I'll put myself out on a limb here, but I don't think there is any meaningful difference between teaching in a classroom and teach well and coaching well. I think they're, they're, there's an awful lot more in common. It will look different and you it may not be for everyone. Like I couldn't be a maths teacher, for example. But if you understand the principles of how to teach, they they pour over very nicely. So um, I think the standard has improved considerably even since I've started because of the boom of the internet and the number of people that are now offering information out there it means good and bad ideas both perpetuate very quickly. But I think there's a few people really trying to make a difference. I know um, uh, Tum Energia, if you know who he is, he's uh, over in Dutch, the Netherlands, I think. Dutch, yeah. yeah. Uh, he does an awful lot of stuff around. He's a former teacher as well, but as a black oh, right. belt and, and basically looked the same way because there was hardly anyone teaching jiu-jitsu in the area and went, hang on, we could make this much more efficient knowing what I know about teaching. Yeah. Uh, I think Lachlan Giles has done an awful lot to try and improve that as well. Um, Preet Mickelson, I think, uh, and a lot of the Globetrotters guys seem to have that sort of approach. I think because they've never had the names to trade on, right. you instead are required to really up your teaching game. Um, now, John B. Will as well, Lachlan Giles' first uh, jiu-jitsu coach. I think he was... Uh, he was one of the first 10 non-Brazilian black belts. Um, I did a seminar with him and it was fantastic. And you could tell that he'd really thought about how to put it together okay. to teach. Um, and Dan Strauss as well with his guillotine seminar. You could tell he'd really sat and kind of honed it um, to make it as applicable as possible. So I think there's quite a few people really trying to improve the standard. At the base level i think the same mistakes are often being made right Such i think as. it's well so the old i have run shits on the old traditional style of class where it's um you know you turn up you do a 10 minute warm-up or in some places 20 minute warm-up try not to be sick you get shown a load of essentially kata style training where you just go oh yeah look how good i am at arm bars and then it's half an hour of rolling because people like rolling and then you so suddenly very you start to hit things on your training partners, but if you go and visit anywhere else, you get beaten up. And the problem there, I think, is that it's a very, very sort of linear approach to learning. It's that I will teach you this technique and you will learn it because you have practiced it. And although that's, I think it's very popular and kind of sexy to shit on that style of training, there is absolutely a time and place for blocked you know, we did arm bars yesterday, we're going to do arm bars on Wednesday, we're going to do arm bars again for the next month. 
if you're peeking for something, if you're trying to turn um, knowledge that's already deep knowledge into fingertip knowledge that you can just access like that, or what people might call muscle memory, but where it's it's quick, it's sharp, it's not you're not making it up on the fly and figuring it out. You, you, it just happens because you've done it. Um, then there's a case for doing that that sort of training where it's quite um, blocked. Yeah. Uh, but the problem I have with that kind of approach is it's quite it can feel quite disjointed. So if you turn up as a as a white belt and you turn up at the wrong point in the year you might be learning um uh sort of think i don't know you might be learning single leg x well who turns up in jiu-jitsu and knows what the fuck to do with single leg x the problem for most people i know some places do fundamentals classes and stuff like that but the the problem is that most people don't understand the principles that sit behind it of like what are we doing what are the different positions what the hell is happening when someone wraps both legs around me how do I feel the difference between that and when someone's in half guard? How do I know what happens when I stand up? Like, there's an awful lot to the game. Like, I think one of the simplest principles that kind of cements, that can make a huge difference for people at that bottom level is understanding the importance of inside space. So yeah. you want to get between someone's arm and knee in guard. If you're a person guard, you want to get between their arm and knee. If you're trying to retain guard you are trying to deny them that space and from that point you can then build everything else yeah. but if they don't get that that's where the fight is then yeah. they expend all this energy and random shit that doesn't <laughs> doesn't do anything so Absolutely. i think the sort of traditional approach can miss some of the really foundational pieces that will actually allow people to make progress quite quickly um and I think it's just because people aren't confident with their teaching. They don't have a lot of teaching experience. There aren't really coaches courses that you can go on. It's you go to some seminars and some seminars are wonderful and some seminars are shite. Yeah. And unfortunately, we still kind of fall for the whole the best athletes make the best coaches bullshit, That's not which true. is yeah. fundamentally incorrect. I think it's changing. Like, look at Lachlan Giles. He's a fantastic athlete and a fantastic coach. Craig Jones as well doing very similar things. Um, but you've also got people like Preet Mickelson, who's who's not like world renowned as a as a competitive jiu-jitsu black belt, but he's producing guys that are now starting to do some really interesting things. Um so yeah, I, I think I think that approach is too disjointed and a lot of people haven't really thought about their curriculum. Yes. Because they make the mistake of thinking that knowing at what time of year you're doing what your focus is, is a curriculum. That's not what a curriculum is. Um, your curriculum should be about, it should start first with, what do we want them to look like? Like, what is the end result? And working back from there. Not, oh, what positions do we need to do? Well, we need to have done, are they, we need to know arm bars. We need to know wrist locks. We need to, I say wrist locks whatever we need to know leg locks we need to know you know uh half guard we need to... that's almost you know january we'll do these february we'll do them march we'll do them that's wonderful if you want an approach where you can show off as a business and go well look everyone is learning about these at this point of the year it's a lot less effective if you're actually thinking about it in terms of teaching you want to make sure that you've already thought about what do you want them to be able to do not what do you want them to know what is it they have to do with that information? Because we all know people who are incredibly technical and can show you the, the finesse points of an armbar, but then they get smashed to fuck by anyone who competes. Yeah. And I think that's where that gap is, that sometimes people think it's all about collecting techniques rather than actually being quite good at most things or and having specific areas where you're very good rather than I'm great at this one armbar from this one setup and this this one reaction and then if anyone does anything different i don't know what to do yeah that's very interesting i've i've noticed in my own training at least taking a block a blocked approach means that i forget other stuff so i'm yeah. spending so long on doing one thing and then they're like okay we've done a month of this and i was like fuck i couldn't even tell you what we did the month before now because i haven't yeah. drilled it once so based on that then what's the solution dave like i know you, you're pretty big on the interleaving idea so what's the sort of solution to like not block not just focus on a blocked 
sort of periodized approach where you forget other positions what what's yeah. another way of doing it so i like um it, the old argument if you watch there's some kit dell videos from uh six or seven years ago now maybe longer where he talked about how he became a black belt in four years and essentially um one of the things that he talked about was he wanted his training to be randomized what he saw was everyone was doing blocked training and having come from a different sporting background and, and being a little bit more aware of what was going on, on in terms of um, the sort of sports science and learning um, theory at the time, he knew that randomized training, the, the evidence suggests that block training makes you really good. And then there's a really sudden drop off and you end up maybe only if you look at the, the where you were and where you end up, you end up maybe slightly higher, sometimes slightly lower. Yeah randomized is a very very slow progression of you get better and worse better and worse better and worse but if you come back and retest people in three months that standard is stuck whereas if you come back and retest someone who's done block training three months later it'll be the same as it was before they started the block training or lower right. it doesn't stick around because um well the because doesn't really matter but the the, the point is it's not human beings like things that stand out we like solving problems we like to see patterns that emerge and i think sometimes if you try and force people into seeing those patterns the shutters come down you get the sort of you get a layer of fuck off at least that's how i think of it is i'm just like oh yeah, i don't want to do this again let me play with something else and i think the solution is introducing some randomization and this was what Kit Dell was talking about in that, why he tended to uh, turn up and just roll because he wanted to be in control of his training and he wanted to um, be able to randomize it in a way that suited him rather than sticking to the blocked curriculum that might be happening wherever he went. So he could, he could decide, right, I know I want to work on arm bars, but I don't know why it's arm bars today, but um, he would say, so I'll make sure that I aim for those, but it doesn't matter where from. Cool. So I'll make sure that I'll I'll let someone pass my guard to here, and then I'll start working and see if I can pick up an armbar on the way. Or he would ask if they could do some positional stuff. And at the time, that was completely unheard of. So I think something you can do to introduce, it's a scale from blocked to random. You can have too much randomization where if you take a, a, a three-week white belt, throw them in competition class, they're fucked. <laughs> they're probably going to leave because it's too much too soon. Yes, okay. They can't cope with the, the level of randomization. So you want to slowly introduce it. And I think that's where interleaving comes in, where you might decide that you've got a, a focus for a week. And then in your second week, you decide that you focus on something else. And that could be related to what you did in the previous week, or it could be completely different. But the point is that it's not the exact same. So you wouldn't do, um, let's do half guard in week one. Okay, let's do lockdown in week two. If you was a starter curriculum, yeah, maybe you will so that it's, it's similar enough. They understand how one moves into the other. But let's say you wouldn't do... Um, uh, Kamura's from half guard in week one and then uh, a slightly different entry to I don't know using the Kamura to set up a back take or using the Kamura to set up a reaction because it's too close to the previous thing right what you could do instead is have the, the Kamura's in week one and then sorry the, the half guard in week one and then in week four you make sure that in the sparring they're doing Kamura's or sorry doing half guard as one of the positionals that they have to do right um yeah that's one way that you could do it you can play with what you introduce in your warm-up you you can have sort of facets of what you're trying to train there you might decide that your warm-up rather than worrying about oh let's run around the mats and do shoulder circles and all this we might cut it down to five minutes and then you you just do um very light positional almost sort of pummeling style where you uh, just set up and go for the, the Kimura. And that could be in week two. So again, you're getting a little bit of half guard in there, but it's as a warm up, and then the actual session won't be on anything to do with that. Right. And then in week three, 
you might do some positional um, sparring from there. And then in week four, you might just decide that the sparring is completely free. And what you will probably notice is a few people will immediately go to the half guard stuff because yep. it's in their mind. Yep. But you're not forcing it. Yep. You're just guiding it yep. rather than it being really heavy handed top down. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like another example I've seen of that, maybe maybe it's just the right example, is uh, in sparring rounds, round one, you start on bottom mount, round two, bottom side control, round three, bottom half. And yeah. every sparring session, you will have interleaved those three positions and your sort of default slash new escapes or whatever that you're working from there so that they're not forgotten. And yet the rest of the round is free for you to do whatever yeah. so you're kind of like you're not you're sort of yeah you're ingraining a little bit every time but then the rest yeah. of it is is open or whatever yeah it's a really uh under explored and under talked about sort of topic i think um yeah but arguably anyone that takes part in those methods for themselves notices a massive change in their game uh, at least i have and i think you've alluded to this before in previous conversations where then you go back and train with partners that have really only absorbed the technique of the week or technique of the month kind of attitude and you are smashing them now with these newfound sort of discoveries of yours yeah. relative to them kind of almost standing still which is a well it's a very fun result if you're the one on the <laughs> on the winning end but it's just fascinating to be like wow we're, we, we, we spend the same amount of times on the mat but just the approach of our attention has meant that now you are repeating the same mistake in this position and because I understand the principle and have kind of dipped into it every sparring session for five minutes, I haven't forgotten it. And I developed a skill set there. And now I can beat you in that area. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, it's fascinating that. But, but also like the level of interest. So you don't want to just. The problem with the block system is, yeah, some people love it, but some people join cults. It doesn't mean it's a, sometimes stuff that makes good business sense doesn't actually make good teaching sense and i think people struggle with the difference between those yeah. so like yeah you might get someone to do a, a blocked sort of approach to to learning but for every person in there that loves that thinks oh my god i'm getting so good there's at least two or three sat in that room going fuck me are we doing these again like yeah. come on where's the fun stuff where's the because ultimately they're paying customers and they're there to enjoy themselves yeah. They don't just competition class. It's different. Yeah. You're going to make it very, very micro positional. Like one of my friends was talking about one where they literally did um, three quarter half guard back to half guard. And that was the aim of the game. Either you got from three quarter to full full pass or someone put you back into half guard and you reset. It's a great way to get loads of reps in. And I think you can include those as little games yeah. um, and sprinkle them in. But he was like, yeah, we did this for two hours. Wow. So it means you put him in that position, he's shit hot. Yeah. Because he's had all those reps. But yeah. if you took someone who just started, they're probably not going to enjoy that. Like I remember at my place, and I don't think my my coach will hate me for saying this too much. At one point he introduced a rule where we sparred every two we had one sparring session every two weeks. We had we had four sessions, so we had two sessions a week, and then Saturdays were open that. And he would do it so that three of the sessions were drilling and then there was sparring for the whole of the fourth one. And I hated it. And I know I wasn't the only one, but I was still early enough that the excitement of getting to that session meant I kept coming because I wanted to learn enough to then be able to do it in the fourth session. But the problem there is it's again, too blocked. It's too strict. There's yeah. not enough experimentation there. So it's, yeah it's always going to sit on a sliding scale between too linear, too blocked, and then too random. And you've just got to know where to sort of turn it up and turn it down and give people space for a little bit of randomization where it's appropriate. So like, the, the most chaotic thing that you could do is live sparring. Yeah. Uh, ideally competition. Competition. Yeah. It's the king. But, yeah. but it, it, you can't replicate that. So the, the best thing in your teaching environment is live sparring in terms of chaos but some people just sit there getting smashed and learn nothing. So yeah. that's why you introduce, like you said, positional, because then you can go, right, okay, you're going to work on, you hate back control. Let's work on how the hell you, you escape from someone on your back, or yeah. you're always getting stuck in, in um, bottom position, like under someone's mount. 
let's learn how to do it yeah um and again those little little things will start to emerge like oh yeah if i don't just lie flat on my back if i just get on my side that's slightly better than being smashed to shit for five minutes on the floor on my back but so many people don't realize that and they like i love mount because so many guys just lie there and you're like what are you doing why are you accepting the worst case position yeah like get on your side at the very least you won't feel like all my weight's going through you yeah but i think that's either something that you start to recognize yourself or something that a coach can push you towards by making you work there the other thing that can help is let more experienced people talk to the less experienced people i absolutely fucking hate this whole like oh be silent like you must train and say nothing and there's a time and a place for that yeah you've got two white belts and they're both talking absolute bollocks to each other you step in as the coach and go lads let's let's try that let's see what happens um but at the same time i don't like the whole you know oh you're not a, a brown belt or above so how dare you tell anyone anything on the mats because it's such a you're losing the potential for having more teachers on the mats or more people doing some teaching on the mats. You can't do it all. You're not a dictator. You know, that's true. And, and you, you as the black belt are not going to know absolutely everything that there is to know about all of those positions. Some people like to play like my coach loves half guard and deep half guard. He's like the go-to guy for that. But if there's positions he doesn't know, he'll say, I don't know, but I'll ask around. And he'll send you off to someone else or, or say, go and talk to them or watch this. Or, and I think sometimes people get caught up in that other idea of they have to be the source of information. Yeah. Um, okay. And it's the thing that you go through as a teacher where you start to realize, oh, actually, there's, there's time and a place for that, definitely. But there's also moments where I could take advantage of the fact that some of the people in here get it and can maybe help the ones that don't. Yeah, totally. An open source mat environment goes a long way, I think. I think it should be encouraged yeah. and... But then also knowing when that isn't appropriate. Yeah, well, shut up, we're going to do this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or having someone come over and go, shut up, you're saying it's absolute crap. Yeah, totally. Or and if, you, and if you're not, still not convinced, let's pressure test it and then we'll definitely know. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Another um, set of parameters I found really interesting in my teaching and also in my learning is um, before going through, let's say, tested and effective methods to relay and teach to people just giving people in the room principles for a position let's take half guard as an example sparring half guard with those principles and just asking them what do you discover so yeah. from bottom half your goal is to get out from bottom half and get on top and principally lying flat on your back for example is not going to help you unless yeah. it's lockdown late stage something like that discover then without lying flat on your back how are you going to get out of bottom half guard to come up let them do it for a couple of rounds. Most people gas themselves shitless because they're using poor technique and don't really know. But they will discover a couple of light bulbs usually for themselves. And then going and sharing perhaps one or two proven methods and then yeah. tell them to go and spar that again. And then usually you find that there's at least a, a percentage jump in their success rate from the first one. But they're, they're allowed to discover. And the permission to discover sort of ingrains the solution more than just being dictated to. Yeah, and I, I think that's the bit that kind of gets me with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's like, where do people think they figured it all out from? It wasn't just taught to that. Someone didn't just go, here is all my knowledge. Oh, I transplanted it to your, you know, there's that kind of aura around the Gracie family. But actually, if you talk to any of them about why they're so good, like Hodger, for example, he lived on the mats. He's yeah. that good because he sat and practiced and experimented and figured it out. Yeah. Like, you need to let people discover, like you've said, you've, you've just described the classic whole part whole methodology where it's, you, you go, right, here you go, solve this problem. Here's the whole sport. Like it's not quite whole because you're not doing a competition level, but you go and try that position. Right, we'll come back. What did we learn? Okay, now we'll break it down to the parts that didn't work or the parts that will work. Practice just that part for a little bit and then back into the the whole environment where someone's resisting and actually fighting them off so that's there's so many different approaches that can be used i just think it's just tradition and kind of dogma that means we we just go oh yeah 20 minute warm up half an hour of technique or an hour of technique and then half an hour of rolling it doesn't have to just that's 
fine. I'm not saying that's wrong because I think actually people can be quite unfair on that approach. There's there's merits to it, but you've got to know when to use that and, and when you can actually step away from that and don't be afraid to sort of experiment with it rather than just assuming there's only one solution to the problem. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Um, last little bit on jujitsu and training then Dave and then let's get stuck into the core stuff um, yeah. approaches that you followed with your own strength and conditioning um, for in, so improved jujitsu performance slash reduced injury risk yeah. uh, anything that's worked for you noticeably with your own body that is kind of you, you stick to or you're, you're, you're pleased you found so I'm not the right person to ask I, I pay Will to program and coach for me like I, I don't well, outsource it own. yeah outsource it yeah that's <laughs> um, a good a good tip. because i just think it's it's one it's it's a little bit of loyalty probably because he's been so kind to me with his time he was he was offering me he was essentially mentoring me before he, he offered like a mentorship or anything like that so and people asked me a few years ago like, oh how did you get into that position like <laughs> what did you do basically i shared history memes with will until he started talking to me uh, and as he pointed out that route is now closed he's not accepting any more applicants that way but, no more means. Uh, I'm, yeah yeah i'm lucky enough that uh to call him a friend so i just think the least i can do is is stick with him with his programming and and it's a collaborative approach like he asked me like what do you want from the next next thing is there anything you want to experiment with is there anything you want to do and we kind of plan together in that way but yeah for me it's difficult because n equals one like i i i can kind of cope with a little bit more frequency in terms of i don't mean frequency as in lots of sessions i tend to do two or three sessions because i'm tight for time but i can break them up i i can do them on separate days like i can i personally although i preach to a lot of my guys of trying to consolidate their stresses i actually like to train one day do jiu-jitsu another day train another day i'm only doing jiu-jitsu once a week at the moment because we've got two small kids and mornings or evenings are off the cards so two kids under two there's absolutely no way i'm leaving my wife to put them to bed by herself like i, I just don't think that's fair so i train once a week on a wednesday and then if i'm lucky at one day and i come out on a saturday so it means it's all self-guided and i can kind of moderate my my training load i generally don't because i like to go full more on every time I roll and everything's a, a like murder fest but um <laughs> like <laughs> a training partner of mine uh said that we should flow roll to warm up he's much better than me so I, I immediately regretted it and I was like yeah okay he knows full well I don't I just think flow roll is bollocks um and <laughs> so I I was in bottom half guard framing and I gently pushed my forearm into his throat he was like, what the fuck's that with the flow rolling? I was like, I gently did it. I didn't, that was, that was a flow roll to your throat. It's fine. Um, I just think, yeah, uh, so I'd rather just go for it. But in terms of training, the things that I've kind of learned from programming for my guys and that I've got from Will are you need to do what the sport doesn't. So jujitsu, there's an awful lot of glycolytic work. There's a lot of anaerobic work. What most guys miss is top end strength. And what a lot of guys also miss is some specific work for those sort of key injury sites. It's, yeah, I'm not setting the world on fire with anything here, but it means for me, my guys lift heavy once a week, um, usually trap bar, sometimes front squat. Depends on the individual. I've had some guys back squat. Um, we do some neck work. We make sure that there's some kind of shoulder work in there because otherwise they kind of end up with these like shoulders that barely move like i had josh who's uh, one of my jiu-jitsu clients who's a gp he's strong as anything he he was so good at bench pressing that whenever he went to overhead press he immediately turned into a strong man and just leaned back and tried to bench press it so his shoulder health was terrible like he said he had a couple of guys just laughing and like kamuring him and, and americanering him because they knew that if they could get into that position they had to do basically nothing um and we just did a lot of uh, his support work was about kind of seated overhead press with dumbbells. So he could, and afterwards he's like, oh, I actually feel my shoulders. Like he came to me and he'd never felt a row before. I went, okay, show me, show me how you do a dumbbell row. It was like Olympic weightlifting, this dumbbell, like literally just going boom. 
I was like, well, no wonder you don't feel your back because you're not you're not actually taking the time to feel it. <laughs> you're trying to throw the thing into the ceiling. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I would say that my approach at the moment is we we get in and get out something heavy. We get in and we get out something explosive. Um, we do jumps because I think there's a whole host of benefits from from um, banded jumps because. Because I like the fact that, as Will explained it to me, it's like the reason he uses them so extensively is there's potential, but the one of the reasons why you pick up lower leg injuries is because it happens very, very quickly. Your body cannot absorb, sorry, not absorb, your counter body cannot, um, oh, I can't think of the word for it. Absorb is wrong. You don't absorb it, but accept. You can't accept the force from the floor quick enough, and that's where you get injured. Overspeed jumps mean that you have to accept the force from the floor much quicker. Admittedly, it's not your full body weight because you're using a band and it's stopping and you. And assisted, yeah, not band yeah, but resisted. yeah, resisted. So the idea being that when you do come to a situation where your leg lands too quickly and you have to accept force quickly, it's not a a, a novel stimulus. You've been there before. You've done it before. Right. Um, so I always have them in. Uh, I like front squats and RDLs and their derivatives because I think grapplers re- I don't like back squatting grapplers unless they've got a massive pre- preference for it because we spend an awful lot of time like this yeah. and an awful lot of grapplers as soon as you do that and try and get them into that nice like lowered position they're either in pain because they haven't got the shoulder mobility um, or I don't know the exact reasons but their shoulders hurt and um, or they just round like this and yeah. then they just end up doing loads of upper back work because something about that front rack not only allows them to squat a little bit better, but afterwards I've had a couple of guys who, who train five or six times, well, one who trains sometimes twice a day, seven days a week, but he immediately said like, my neck feels better, my shoulders feel better, my upper back feels better. Yeah. And it's just because he spent so much time in that position, actually loading up that position feels really good. Yeah, So absolutely. yeah. Heavy stimulus, hit all the key areas, and then a little. I like a little bit of fluff work after we've done our well, fluff work, pump work when we've done our um, uh, trap bar work, so that they can feel good. So whether that's kind of three three to four sets of twelve of neck movements, three to four sets of twelve of, um, like uh, pull apart plate work so just really really light work to remind their body of how it's allowed to move essentially yeah um direct bicep work i think really gets underplayed you know oh yeah it's something i did when i first came it's like oh yeah no i i'm about i'm about functional muscle fuck off everything's functional idiot it just depends what the function is like yeah and and that was me (laughs) yeah 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 exactly that was me like being a dumbass but it it seems to help and it seems to in my head the way i think of it is that it seems to remind you of ways in which your body can move i think jiu-jitsu is a pretty good sport for that because there's an awful lot of different movements yeah but there are key things you tend not to do in jiu-jitsu you tend not to extend and open up like that so generally that's quite helpful you tend to do a lot of flexion so i don't like very much loaded flexion I'm, i'm cautious around that I tend not to like loading a lot of neck work. I'm probably a bit too hesitant there um, just because I think you can overdo it very quickly because you're already getting an awful lot of sort of neck work from jujitsu, whether it's defending chokes, whether it's, you know, people who use their face to pass and stuff like that. Um, Oh, pull-ups, fuck loads of pull-ups. I want my grapplers to have big upper backs and big forearms. So yeah, yeah, a lot of pull-ups, a lot of chin-ups. Um, and not a lot of volume so a lot of sets but three to five reps generally so that means we can load quite quickly I like I don't think personally I haven't seen very many great things come when someone can bust out 15 to 20 pull-ups I I don't think that's where the the benefits lie I think you're better off starting to load and work from there personally get the strength up instead of the just strength endurance or you're pretty much specializing at that point to be a pull-up king aren't you when you're exactly. pushing out above in my experience above 12 reps you're specializing yeah. below and a lot that, of these guys are already trashed particularly gi guys because because their grips are trashed their 
they're in those kind of positions. They've got the the kind of strength endurance that they need for on the mats. So then yeah. why am I chasing it with, with something that I could load? Yeah, exactly. You don't need to <laughs> double down on that one direction. Yeah, exactly. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. That's a nice that's a nice plethora of of things. Just when you were talking about the front squat there, I was just thinking trap three work I think is underrated. Every every time I've spent time doing some trap three work to offset the upper yeah. back flexion, I notice a difference. And actually if I can get a tiny bit of DOMS in that trap three, I find it actually helps me during the day to open back up where I'm normally even now sat talking yeah. to you. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. defending elbow and knee. But it's <laughs> um yeah, trap three work I think is underrated. I found some good mileage in uh behind the neck press out of a squat position, which is actually really difficult to do with anything yeah. other than a barbell, I find. Even that is bloody I've hard. I've never I've never done it from a squat position, but behind yeah. the neck press is one behind of the Behind the neck press, favorites. yeah, real yeah, real nice one um and then what else came to mind there on the oh yeah another line of inquiry i'm quite interested is crawl based things so i know will's got the sort of the shoulder taps from the four point position but it's so interesting that jiu-jitsu is very often side lying or sort of supine or seated flexed based postures but crawling doesn't really exist even the referee's position your knees are down so having your knees off the floor and just posting on your toes and hands doesn't actually exist in the sport as much as so i i would say it, it's i like it um you've just made me realize something i think that's why so many people's top side controls shit because you're not posting on your hands and knees sorry hands and feet in the same way but if you want to put your weight through someone in side control, yeah, you want the cross face. Yes, you want to pull them in. But if you can pull them in and then bring your knees off the floor, so it's your toes are on the floor, your knees are not far off the floor so that you don't get swept. But people tend to try and drive into side control and that's yeah. where they get swept or set themselves yeah. up for, for um, having a bad time. Whereas if I can get into side control, pull them in as close as physically possible, get the cross face and then all I think about is getting my tiptoes into the floor and pull my knees up as if I were in a bear crawl position but with my arms like this there you go you'll hear it your opponent yeah, will go, yeah. <gasps> forced exhales then, yeah yeah because all your weight's going directly yeah. down through them and you're use, almost using them as like a bench to lean on or yeah um so yeah sorry you just sparked that off that maybe that's that's it I don't I, I don't use a lot of it though to be fair I don't we'll, we'll do some of the shoulder tap stuff in um the only other thing is low volume. So aside from the really specific, um, you know, three sets of 12 on the like almost robustness circuit area, I do not like giving people a lot of volume because it's, grapplers are generally beaten up anyway. Yeah. So I don't want to add a training method that's going to beat them up. I want them feeling fresh. I'd rather... Like I'd rather they were working between eighty and ninety percent, just doing three sets of three. Why? Why would I chase any further than that? Yeah, agreed. I played with that, and I felt the difference by doing that. It's uh, the high intensity blocks that I've done actually work remarkably well with just the super low volume and you know sort of semi semi frequent application. Because you're right, if you especially when you're training, when you start training over five days a week. It's like what you do in the gym has to be really kind of well thought out, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, one one or two top sets goes a lot further than sort of five or six, yeah, sets of twelve to the point where you're too sore to fucking take a shit or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not what you need. Um, fantastic, right? Meat and potatoes. This is the bit I have been waiting for. This is the bit everyone has been really waiting for, and that is the navigating the grey area. So last episode, I tried to do uh, just a little kind of teaser, really, for everyone that hadn't listened. Just a little intro as to. Um, the navigating the grey area course, uh, learning how yeah. to think critically that I enrolled in with yourself um, well, a couple of months ago now before before I left Canada. And, yeah, you yeah, were first intake. Well, yeah, first intake. Wicked. Yeah, privileged to actually be on that. I didn't realize that. But um, and what a fantastic course it was. And, uh, and, and I'm still actually dipping into the material and I think I probably will be for a long time. Um, cool. So my first question, Dave, then is, is why did you why did you put the course together? Uh, maybe just a little brief kind of like couple of lines. What is what does it mean navigating the grey area for those that haven't listened to the kind of teaser episode before? And then yeah. let's start with I've got lots of questions about it, but let's start with you know why did you put this course together? Um, so coming into strength and conditioning from 
history teaching, I saw an awful lot of people falling for the kind of stuff that I'd spent most of my career trying to trying to deal with. So I think history and philosophy have solved an awful lot of the issues that people have around thinking logically and making logical mistakes and getting stuck in modes of thinking. But I don't think it gets taught very well explicitly at school. I don't think it gets taught very well explicitly at university um, necessarily. I don't think it necessarily has to be. But I think sometimes that's something that's really lacking when people come away from the university environment. I, I think sometimes university underestimates how easy it is to simply play the game and get far enough. Um, in the same way, that I think a lot of teachers think that as well. So what I noticed was coaches didn't know who to listen to, particularly young coaches. They didn't know who was full of shit and who wasn't. They didn't know why some exercises made sense and some were clearly bullshit. They didn't know. Um, they were listening to people because of the number of followers they have, not whether they're any good or not. Um, and they were just a bit lost, really, because it's quite disheartening when you feel that way. And I, I remember feeling the same way as a teacher at first. And I put the course together because I just thought, if there's something I can do to help, if I'm noticing these these things, and this seems to be what's setting apart people who are good and excellent from the people who are struggling, then maybe this is something, maybe there's a market for this. And, yeah, and if everyone gets a little bit better at this, the whole industry benefits. And in, as a result, all yeah. those people working with benefit. And, and ultimately that's, that's the purpose of it. But I mean, as you pointed out, really it's probably my rant as a history teacher about the fact that everyone should do this course because most people have no idea how to deal with information. Like they don't Zero. know how to sort it. They don't Zero. know how to I didn't, evaluate really. it. I just went on instinct. I went on preference. I went on, is this guy a prick? Do I like his yeah. shorts? You know, whatever it is. Can he actually, most of the time, actually, my main bias was, can they do what they're, they're talking about? Yeah. You know, or are they uh, the fat PT kind of thing? Yeah. You know, and I was just like, and and I honestly base it on that. And I'm like, well, actually, that's not necessarily fair. What if they're injured? You know, like the, these kind of things. But I yeah. had my own biases too. So you're right. I don't think many people do actually have a, uh, a system, a system in place to yeah. go through information. Yeah. So I'm just going to, I've got my little list of things that I noticed in your, <laughs> in your review that you did last week. Uh, some things that I had to pull you off on. So the first one was, we talked about this one. I am not a professor. I didn't work in academia. Yes, so I clearly don't understand what academia means. I always thought it was the world of academic thinking. I didn't realize it was like PhD and beyond. No, yeah, it's, it's got a very specific uh, uh, meaning, but uh, it is what it Were is. Were you academic? Sorry, not sorry. Yeah, <laughs> before they all get really upset and write letters to the Times. Um, yeah, so you, you talked about bias. I think that's really important is, this whole thing about biased and unbiased is fucking GCSE. Everything is biased. Everyone is biased. You're biased. I'm biased. My mum's biased. The greatest, like Stephen Hawking was biased. The greatest minds of our time are all biased. This bias versus unbiased is just bullshit. Unbiased, is, well, not, that's not fair, sorry. It's a sliding scale. So the most that you can do is to be more aware of your biases and your kind of blind spots and try to make sure you have other people that you talk to who fill those blind spots so that you at least get a decent understanding of the opposing view. And a lot of that comes out of um, history where it's about you, you need to know why someone would say what they were saying. So like I, I someone that I used to train with who, said to me oh well you're just teaching you know what you know what you're teaching kids is just rumors because then you are as a history teacher I was like no dickhead what I'm teaching them is how to work out which of those rumors are more likely accurate and which ones are more likely to be like he thought he'd like pulled the rug out from under me and I just thought well I'm sorry you've had a shit history teacher because clearly they've just taught you a load of information and told you it's accurate but that's actually not what what teaching history is about it's about teaching to deal with like the reason it's called the gray area that gray area between right and wrong um good and bad like whatever they're, they're all false dichotomies what's really there is this awkward bit in the middle where you're like well they're right about that but then they said this which is clearly horseshit but then they've said that which is really good and you just don't know where to sort of stand so um accepting that everyone will have their biases is important so yeah um 
I mean, the the classic example is um, recognizing as well that people can change over time. So, for example, I quite like a lot of Jordan Peterson's work around the hero's myth and how you can use that for yourself. I don't really like his stance on gun control. I don't really like that he started talking about climate change. I don't really like the fact that he's constantly got his daughter on his podcast who doesn't seem to have any understanding of anything, but that's <laughs> fine. It, it, it's, that's my bias is that I go, oh, I like that bit, but fuck all the rest of it. Yeah. And some people feel that you need to accept everything. It's like Joe Rogan. Oh my God, he's so good. Or he's so bad. Oh, Joe Rogan's hilarious. He doesn't have a fucking clue about exercise. So I don't know why there are genuine strength coaches going, no, no, he's okay. No, he isn't. He's a guy who's taken TRT steroids most of his adult life, who part owns a training and supplement company. Why would he, like, why would I take any of that as a gospel? Coach. Or at yeah. least, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there we go. And I think he'd say the same thing, which is the ironic part. But um, yeah, we we are all biased. So we just have to be aware of how those biases awareness. exist. Yeah, it's not an eradication. Yeah, exactly. We're not trying to eradicate bias. We're just trying to be more aware of, like, yeah, not being dogmatic in our own biases. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, because that's also, a great point. Like, some biases are useful. Like, yeah, for sure. They're there for a reason, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, um, so I talk about, like, the egotistical little dickhead in my head. Like, I am the, the whenever anyone says anything, my immediate reaction is bullshit. And it really pisses my wife off. And rightly so. I'm always contentious. I always find the count of you. And I think it, it's, I can see the appeal for people. Like today, there seems to be a really big push for being contentious as a personality. Like they don't actually believe anything. It's just whatever is mainstream is wrong. Right. And it's like, that isn't the foundation for anything. I like that. I think things are bullshit immediately because I think it through and then I'll come back to it and go, oh, actually, no, maybe it isn't. And it will give me a better understanding of both things rather than just going, oh, they said it on the news, got to be wrong. Or, um, oh, everyone's really into, oh, yeah, everyone's wearing sun cream at the moment. Oh, idiots, that gives you cancer. I'm just going to sun my balls. Like, that's just, you're being contentious for the sake of it. And then, oh, I'm only going to eat meat because I'm responding to vegan. Like, you're just living life as a reactionary rather than having a fundamental principle. So, sorry, I've rambled there. But just being aware of your biases and understanding that you're, the problems that you're facing are not you. They are as old as human beings. It's the one thing that history has taught me is we have not changed. We, it's why I don't really like the horrible histories books. I loved them as a kid. I saw a wonderful talk with uh, uh, Ben Walsh, who, if anyone's nerdy enough will remember, wrote the fantastic modern world history textbook that's about that thick. So if you're ever in a history classroom and there was this massive fucking green textbook and your teacher opened it and you're like, fuck's all this other bit of the GCSE that we've never done. And your teacher was like, turn to page 300 and something. Don't look at everything else. That was the Ben Walsh textbook that he put together. And he opened a talk with <laughs> horrible <laughs> Terry Deary is a dickhead and horrible history is a shit. <laughs> and he, he said, you can quote me on that. But the point that he was making is horrible histories makes fun of people in the past. And that's very easy to do when you're standing the other side of the events. Because if you look back, you're naturally biased to see the outcomes of those events as obvious. Right. Um, so I used to get it with kids where they're like, well, why didn't all the Jews just run away from the Nazis? You're like, well, if it had been that fucking obvious, they all would, do you not think? Like, yeah. Uh, or why did everyone sign up in World War One? Didn't they know what was coming? No, of course not. Otherwise, no one in their right mind would sign up. It's why after a year and a half, they had to introduce conscription because yeah. no one wanted to sign up. Yeah. Um, so it's realizing that human beings fundamentally still make mistakes and still do things for the same reasons. There's not some magic thing that makes us clever or special today that yeah we haven't quantum ideas. leapt it no we are we have the same issues as the greeks did kind of thing yeah yeah exactly exactly sorry go on yeah no fantastic um totally yeah totally bang on on the on the biases front and i, I and i also i felt like enrolling on um enrolling on the course 
uh, I was encouraged to spend some time looking at my biases with the assignments that you had given and I actually didn't find them that easy to do and I had to spend some time thinking and practicing and sort of stretching my brain a little bit actually to kind of get outside of the parentheses of my own bias to actually try and see things from other standpoints and amongst many things on the course I found that um, to be very useful and I guess that that transitions nicely to asking you um, as many people have asked me in the last week or so when we've been talking about this this course um, how is the course structured like how have you structured it I, I believe it's eight weeks in duration yep. right and so how have you broken that down to kind of sort of build these these skill sets uh, so sorry I have to get it up in front of me because I forget every single time I start talking about it um, essentially we, we week one we start with kind of background um, you know why are we doing this why do I think this matters um, uh, here we go so why are we doing this so it's a little bit about um why i've put it together and who i am but it's also an opportunity for everyone to kind of introduce why they're doing it like what they're hoping to get out of it why they um want to be there because if you don't know why you're there then you shouldn't fucking be there um and if you haven't got your why sorted out as like there's all these like cliche quotes aren't there where it's like start with why but it's true because if someone doesn't understand why they're doing something then there's no point teaching them how to do it i think it's why part of the reason why maths can be so inaccessible at times for kids is because there's so much to deal with and it's so complex you can't always easily kind of make it an obvious why i'm sure there are wonderful math teachers out there who can but that's where the cell sometimes is. And there's a history department we really worked on, you know, why are we doing this? Because otherwise it can just feel very detached from your modern day life. And yes. it has to be a meaningful why, because yes. if it's just, why are we doing this? And you sort of go, oh, because it matters to your local history. And? Yeah, so it's not I, strong enough, yeah. Yeah, I, that first week's nice because it allows people to sort of think about what is it they want to get from, from their career, what is it they want to get from this course? What is it they're hoping for? It also sneakily allows me to kind of see who is everyone, what background do they come from, and how can I try and give them examples that are more accessible? Yeah. Um, week two, why do we make mistakes? Probably one of the most important weeks, and it gets a little bit underrated because mistakes matter. I don't know if you've seen any of Will Whalen's tweets recently where we've kind of talked about this, and I know Mladen Jovanovic and any decent strength and conditioning coach will talk about iteration and the fact that you learn from your mistakes. I have something in the course that becomes a little bit cheesy towards the end, but I, I like it anyways. So mistakes are only failures if you fail to learn from them. Otherwise, they're useful. Like we have always made mistakes as a species. We make them for a variety of different reasons. And as long as those mistakes don't ruin us, so in our until recent history kill us yeah. then then we can learn from them so in the same way uh, as long as these mistakes don't ruin us and our business we can find that information useful so it's it helps to get that feedback from them and assuming you're never going to make a mistake for the rest of your life just means you won't notice when you make mistakes so you'll miss out on all that free information that you could have got because you don't want to look because it's that awkward dark and yeah. actually I, I open up in that first week with probably the biggest mistake I ever made in my career, which was, um, fuck, it was really, yeah, it was awful. I, I basically got a bit arrogant about how I taught one of the A-level um, coursework pieces and fucked it up. And my boss had to fix everything and help those kids in a very short space of time. Now, I don't know how much I'd fucked it up because in my head it was the biggest fuck up of all time. I imagine in reality it was probably not quite that. But what I do know was she didn't really want to talk to me for about six weeks. And I had to really drag myself back up from that and rebuild. And I ended up going on a wonderful uh, course called Schools History Project where I met loads of like-minded people that really inspired me. And it, it, that horrible process I had to go through to become the kind of teacher where I was actually quite proud of what I did by the end. Um, I open with that not to show off but more because I think sometimes people think we just mean little mistakes and actually sometimes the biggest mistakes no matter how embarrassing and upsetting they are and how much we don't like to think about them it, that's more to do with how you choose to frame them 
whereas you can get an awful lot from from looking back at them and they can be very helpful even if they're quite painful so I think as well it sets up nicely the idea that we've all made mistakes if you think you've never made a mistake you're joking like of course you have so you need to have a little bit of empathy for people making mistakes because if you just go oh fucking dickhead why didn't they know that then you just sound like a prick and they won't learn from you if you belittle people when they make mistakes um there's a little caveat to that. If they should know better and they're making those mistakes on purpose, by all means, have at it, be a dick. But I think an awful lot of the people that we interact with as coaches make mistakes because they don't know any better, not because they know better and they're stupid. Um, and it's easy to see it as that rather than seeing it as they make mistakes because they don't know any better. Right. Um, sorry, so week three, we talk about the pitfalls. So we start to discuss like the big one, like right and wrong, having a binary relationship. You're either 100% right or you're 100% wrong. When in reality, it's usually shades of gray. We'll never completely know. The most right we can know something is, is 99.9%. Um, I would argue, because there's always space for the potential that that thing is wrong. Um, False dichotomies in general, so people turning it into this, and you're either with me or against me. Fuck off. No, I'm not. I don't know who you are. I, I'm quite happy <laughs> to just sit there and go, I don't know. Um, then the concept of freedom of speech being the same as a quality of opinion, like why would you ask me about astrophysics and put that on the same pedestal as Stephen Hawking? Like My brother went to Oxford University. I wouldn't ask him about anything that wasn't like... I wouldn't expect him to have a, a higher level of knowledge about something than, than anyone else who is an expert in that area. It's, it's a mistake that we make sometimes as we think because someone can say it. And often if they sound like me and they can say it with confidence, people believe it. Oh yeah. We've seen that in politics recently. Like, Oh yeah. Well, if I just lie to you, but I make the lie sound nice and I've got a posh accent, suddenly everyone will think I'm just this terrible bumbling poor fellow. And it just, yeah, it's one that gets me there is we've got to figure out who we should listen to and why. And the first one is to remember that everyone can speak and that is good, but it doesn't mean we need to value everyone's opinion equally. That is bullshit. Um, week four, we look at the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, so the idea that lots of people when they first start out learning about something are dangerous because they think they know everything. And that actually it takes a little bit of time to pass over that hill and suddenly start to realize, oh, fuck, I know nothing. And then you drag yourself back out of that experience and learning. Um, ultra crepidarianism. So again, the idea that you don't talk to someone who doesn't know anything about that field. Um, or promiscuous expertise where people kind of, because they've got good at one thing, they think they can offer opinions outside of that thing. You see it in jiu-jitsu all the time. Um, they're good at jiu-jitsu. So here's my take on world politics. It's like that, that they don't equate. Um, correlation and causation. Like so many people think that a correlation means that on something causes something else. The classic ones, ice cream trucks and sunshine, they correlate, but ice cream trucks don't change the weather. <laughs> it's the other way around. But if you just understood the correlation, you could make the mistake the wrong way around. Uh, week five, we look at some more pitfalls. So we talk about uh, dogmatic ideas. So not being open to the concept, the idea that you might be wrong. Appeals to authority, so, oh, yeah, so-and-so is this good and they say this. Um, the burden of proof, which is a great one. Uh, anyone who's full of shit will always try and put the burden of proof on you when you point out a problem in their idea. If someone has a great idea or a new theory or this changes everything, then the burden is on them to actually prove it rather than expecting you to believe them. And then my personal favourite, I wish you'd all stop being me, which is the idea that somehow by debating discussing things with one another um we're bringing our profession down uh, you know oh i can't speak on their situation because x but you can but you just caveat it and say well i don't know yeah. the full story yeah or you'd be polite about it simple solution you'd be uh, so something I, I sort of thought about recently is be kind not nice so kind is you can kill someone with kindness you can't kill someone with niceness. All right. Um, you, you can be polite while you're also stabbing them in the back, <laughs> if that makes sense. It sounds a bit vicious. But what I mean is 
you want to be as kind about what they're saying as possible, but it doesn't mean that you take the edge off your criticism. It just means right. that you're not a dick about it. Yeah, you're not a, a dick about them. You're a dick about the idea. Right. That's a really important statement because a friend of mine actually asked me this exact question the other day. We hadn't seen each other for a long time. And he said to me, how do I get my point across relative to my friend's question or statement that is clearly fucking wrong and stupid without completely belittling them and just crushing them to a point where they think I'm the prick? So something that I found helpful is is one, you shut up and listen. Ask them a load of questions. Ask them why. Because the more you know about why someone has come into that belief, the more useful or the more tailored you can make your response. Like belittling someone is is perfect. You're going to fall into all the traps of, let's take Flat Earth, for example. Oh, you fucking idiots. That just pushes them into that kind of uh, cult mindset where it's like, oh, us versus them. Like, oh, you're one of them. They always make fun of us because they know we've got the real knowledge. Um, and that's comforting because cognitive dissonance is uncomfortable. So the idea that you think one thing and then some evidence comes and shows you that you are wrong, it's, it's almost a little bit painful. We don't like it as a species. It's why sometimes the most innovative ideas in, in medicine or science take a while for people to get accustomed with them because at first it's, ah, no, fuck off, don't like change. And that reaction is important because it means we don't throw away the things that work, but it can also play against you. So listen to them about why they think what they think. Ask them lots of questions. Sometimes just keep saying why, because if if they start to take you through their logic, sometimes as they're saying it out loud, they may start hearing it for the first time and go, fucking hell, yeah, why do I think that? Yeah. yeah. That actually doesn't sound very good out loud. They unravel and don't, it sort of thing, yeah. But don't be a dick, because the second you start being a smug, like, dickhead, the, the the like layers of fuck off just come straight back up. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. The other thing is try to put what, try to take the logic of their argument and apply it to a context that they're going to be more amenable to. So I had a friend who um, wanted to do strength and conditioning and said, um, oh, I might just, join the gym and kind of make it up as i go along and he's a plumber and i was like okay i was like what do you think i said okay well let me give you an example what would you say if my boiler wasn't working and i said oh don't worry i've watched a few things on youtube i'm gonna have a go myself and he was like i'd say you're a fucking idiot i was like ta-da like (laughs) and and it's allowing someone to get to that point themselves now fit he decided to work by himself. We had a bit of a chat and he did some stuff by himself and it's fine, but it's taking someone through the same steps that they're doing, but completely changing the context can sometimes allow someone to cope with that cognitive dissonance because they can accept it in a different circumstance. Yes, that's massive, especially if they're familiar with that circumstance, like your example there, like plumbing. He was very familiar with plumbing. So for you to use that sort of like figure of speech, he could really relate to that. Yeah, and or like, wouldn't, um, wouldn't take offense sort of yeah. personally either, which is also you can get past the sort of defense mechanisms that way. That's yeah. that's massive. Like jujitsu guys with the whole like oh, pro COVID, anti COVID, like all that shit. You just go, right, well, if you were learning jujitsu, would you ask for opinions on jujitsu from the jujitsu black belts that compete or some judo white belts? They go, oh, well, obviously the jiu-jitsu black belts. You're like, so then why are you listening to someone with the same degree as me tell you about how vaccines work rather than listening to the person who's made vaccines before, who's also a doctor, who also works in the system that they're trying to protect? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, good point. (laughs) And it, it just means that you've taken them through the process rather than just go, you're wrong, dickhead. Yeah, which no one likes. So that, that's what I'd suggest. I don't. Sometimes fantastic. it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But. No, no, fantastic. That's a, a powerful communicative skill. If if for life, if not just our our fields. Okay, so that alludes a little bit on the course then to your the sort of pitfalls, and then yeah. second half. What else was in the mix? Ah, oh, so we look at the tools. So um, 
The first tool is history and source analysis. So the ability to look at the, the content of something and judge whether it's right or wrong, but also to look at the context of who is that person? Why are they saying it? What is their audience? You know, for example, people sometimes say that information is either useful or useless. That's, it's, that's crap. It depends what you want it for. So if you're trying to find like, the classic example I can think of is from teaching Nazi Germany, because every history teacher in England teaches Nazi Germany. But um, if you wanted to learn about the Night of the Long Knives, when the Nazis set fire to the Reichstag and blamed it on the communists, if you wanted to know the truth of why that happened or what happened, you wouldn't ask Hitler, you wouldn't use his accounts. But if you wanted to know, because Hitler blames the communists, but if you wanted to know how Hitler took advantage of this situation, you absolutely want his first-hand account because he immediately turns it into a rant about the communists and how he needs more power. So it would be easy to say, Hitler's biased, why would I listen to him? When actually there's a whole dearth of information you can get from him as long as you bear the context in mind of he's talking to the press, it's a public opportunity to denounce a group he doesn't like. There's a whole host of information you can get from there if you just ask the right questions. So. I think source analysis is really helpful because often when you're a young coach, you don't know enough about applying the information to know whether what say, someone's saying is bullshit or not. But you can look at who are they? What do other people think of them? Who have they worked with? What have they said about them? And I know some people see that as a bit kind of snaky, but I just think that's sensible information gathering. Like, why would I not want to know what do people who've done their programs think? You know, the big one at the moment is the old knees and toes nonsense. You can see an awful lot of people who've done those courses and still have knee problems. Yeah. And just go and seek them out and then make the decision for yourself. You don't have to, if you only talk to the people who like it, then of course they're going to tell you it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. So find out what people think of them and ask a variety of different people whenever i see something new online i probably chris, piss chris Meyer off for this but i ask lots of different coaches so what do you think of this guy yeah not because i think one of them is going to give me the right answer but because i want to see what the consensus is yeah. or i want to hear differing opinions on it because then that can help me with what my gut feeling was yeah um then we look at thinking critically and iterating so um I think critical thinking and thinking critically are two separate things. Thinking critically is a process. Critical thinking is a school of philosophy. Um, thinking critically means that you look back over the things that you've done, you judge yourself harshly because that allows you, you know, how did I make this mistake? How is it my fault? Because then that allows you to make changes. And if you can answer that question and go, well, actually it wasn't, then that's okay as well. But you have to be harsh about it. If you haven't tried to actively think of ways something is your fault then you can't just go out oh, it's not my fault um what else here we go so iterating sorry just to be clear on that just means making little mistakes and adapting to them right so you just accept that you do some little bits of experimentation that won't ruin your training or your programming and allow yourself to be critical about them and decide whether you should really adopt them or not um and then week seven we look at the next set of tools so we look at the difference between science and scientism, which I think is a huge one that people fall into. Um, the scientific process is a wonderful thing. Um, like standing in a room, having a big circle joke about how science is the greatest thing that ever happened is also not a helpful thing, um, I think. So for example, because when I was writing all of this was during the talks about vaccine hesitancy and loads of people were like, oh, fucking idiots, vaccines are the greatest thing that's ever happened. You're like, yes, that's absolutely true. But it's also absolutely correct for um, people who are hesitant around vaccines to say that the, the medical community doesn't always have the safest track record at introducing new things. So lots of people in the UK raised the problem of thalidomide. And unfortunately, the conversation around, for people who don't know this, but thalidomide was a drug that was marketed as an anti-emetic, so it stopped me being sick, and it was given to uh, women suffering from morning sickness. Now, unfortunately, it turned out that had not been tested properly on pregnant women, because you can't do testing on pregnant women. It's not allowed. Um, and as a result, it turned out it, it led to a lot of birth defects. As a result of all of that, 
the entire industry had to pass a set of rules or the industry in the UK went, holy shit, that's not okay. We cannot let that happen again. One, because no one will ever buy our products if we're the company that adheres to those training, like those regiments. And the NHS went, holy shit, we can never let that happen again. We're supposed to be for the people. So both of them improved their systems to ensure that never happened again. And I think sometimes people forget that most of the people working in these industries aren't horrible pieces of shit. They feel just as guilty about what happened there. Um, it's become very popular to think that everyone who works in an industry is just this amoral, like, guy, like 80s guy laughing all the way to the bank, just standing on children and, you know, like the, the typical Robocop style evil corporate. And they think that's what everyone is. And in reality, systems are made up of a whole load of people. So people do feel guilt when those kinds of things happen. And you didn't necessarily have a lot of people taking the time to explain, yes, that's why that happened. And you're right to point that out. But actually, that's led to a more secure and safer system. You just had people going, oh, fucking idiot. And all that does is just shut down like those layers of fuck off again, come up on both sides. And suddenly everyone's talking past each other and no one's having a conversation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that one's important remembering that we have to be honest about the failings of the scientific methods as well, not just assuming it's the greatest thing that's ever happened, despite it providing us with wonderful pieces of technology and improving people's lives. Um, there are still genuine concerns around it. And then the last one's killing the baby or aggressive proofreading. So the idea that you can't be critical, you can't be critical about other people if you're not critical about yourself. So you need to be the critic first because one, it allows you to practice the process of believing something that isn't just what you believe and holding another idea in your head, even though you don't like it. And two, it allows you to head some people off at the pass and see some of the criticisms before they arrive. So you're getting useful feedback already. So it's, it's just sort of an opportunity to make sure that your work isn't crap and also practice what we've talked about before you start applying it to anyone else. Um, and then the last one is, is kind of reflections. It's basically a bit of a Zoom call where we just kind of talk about the whole course and people can ask questions and um, we can talk about how to apply it, kind of practice it and troubleshoot anything that anyone had about the whole, the whole course. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so you said Zoom there. Um, how is the, the course delivered then in terms of technology? Like what do people need to just access your course? Uh, a phone or a computer. So it, it's all done through Discord. So the, the, um, there's reading every week, which is a pitch short PDF. And then there's a video of me kind of, <laughs> it initially started off as audio for the people who wanted it. And it was just me reading it. And I realized that actually a bit of a, that's a bit of like the teacher reading the presentation that's already on the board to you, which is shite. So I decided to, off the back of some feedback from some people who ran the, um, who tested it for me, I put together some videos where we kind of, I talk about that topic, but then it's almost like an easier in, and then people can use the PDF to back it up and kind of go into a little bit more detail or go over things. Then there's a couple of tasks, so some questions to think on for the whole of the week. So we did a, I released the videos on Sunday, the video and the PDF. You've got all week to think about the tasks and start like applying it in your week. Um, I've just started doing, I'll provide a, a an example because one of the fellas off the last course said that there were a couple of the pitfalls where he really struggled to find a, a appropriate idea so i'm i'm offering a here's one you can have a go at if you don't notice one in your day-to-day -day life um and then people can answer ask questions on the discord they can um they can do voice notes and send them up they can write out their answers they can do whatever form they want um, the idea being that hopefully some of you will start to talk to each other about it. So it's a bit more like a classroom because you, you can all talk to each other on the Discord in that central server. And then on the Saturday, I do a little video where I go over any questions that I've had or ideas people have come up with and just sort of go through anything that anyone asked me about. And then we start again on Sunday. But the videos tend to be sort of 15 minutes or shorter, if I can keep it to that. 
ironically, yeah. with how much I've rambled on this. Uh, no, not at all. I think um, I really found that helpful on the course was your uh, explanations of the PDF files. So I'm glad you didn't just read them out because I would have switched off. <laughs> um, but having you explain a little bit deeper about yeah the, the context there and what's going on with those PDFs, I found that really helpful. I found the course very accessible. I did do some bits on my phone. I did do some bits on my laptop. I did move halfway across the, the world halfway through <laughs> and still managed to kind of log in and airport wi fis and stuff and still see stuff going on. So it's super accessible in terms of technology. So anyone listening, you think, oh, you know, I'm not really a computer guy or I'm not really, you know, sort of technological, doesn't matter. You've got a phone. You have to, especially if you're a coach anyway, you, you've got a phone and you're booking in clients. And that's, I would say, all the technical prowess you need to be able to enroll. Um, yeah. So I found that was that was super accessible. And then, like I sort of mentioned earlier, the assessments, uh, the assignments that you set were, were fantastic and mind bending and took a took a little bit to get into. I think the example ones to have a go at would also be great. And then you also said something really important there, which I took for granted in my recent chapter in life of the sort of the alchemist parable of going all the way around the world only to find that what I had was on my doorstep in the beginning about talking to people in the classroom. And I'm very fortunate that I'm at a facility now, Locker 27, where we have a cafe there that has a table in it and that table became a literal forum before I left for, for Canada a few years ago where we would discuss ideas, pick each other's brains, call each other out on shit in a way that was done in a really um, sort of really in a really good fashion where no one felt threatened, no one felt defensive, no one really took anything personally but we were still on a friendly enough basis to call each other on something if we thought it was shit or just ask people questions. Hey, you know, a bit like you were doing with the coaches. What do you think about this guy? Or what do you think about this, this idea? Yeah. But the fact that you've introduced this into the course and done it in a digital fashion into a classroom setting, I think is massive because, uh, you know, I spent a long time in Canada where it wasn't possible where the places I was working to have these discussions with other professionals, whether it was just because of a lack of logistical space, whether it was just because of a lack of culture, whether it was because it was just a lack of knowledge, like people didn't realize that that's something you could do in a workplace, like you could actually discuss believe it or not, the very things that you're doing. So I'm really pleased that you've, you've put that into the mix on the course in a digital fashion. And uh, I really enjoyed that part, like reading through other people's answers and just kind of see what angles other people were coming from. And actually, I'm still going through the Discord now and just going back through some, some stuff. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, so if you're listening to this or you're watching this and you're thinking, you know, oh, there's a couple of bits that I'm not quite quite sure if I've got that skill set or I'm not quite sure I've ever been taught that. That's, I think, all the evidence you need to sign on to this and register for the September intake because um, these skills aren't taught. They're just not taught formally. Like I was thinking when you were talking earlier, like if you do a, a regular personal trainer qualification now across six to 12 weeks, whatever the average is, are you telling me you're going to spend the rest of your personal training career only executing what was taught to you on the course material? Like, it's just not, that's just not, not only is that um, just not plausible in terms of an ever-changing world, but man, you'd be the most boring trainer in the world. And arguably, you probably wouldn't even get any fucking results because half of the course material is awful. Yeah. So by definition, you need to go and look at other sources of information to then put into your work, right? Especially if you want to serve your clients. And that was one thing I really liked how you iterated in the course was that this is about serving the people you're working with and giving them the best possible service. Well, by definition, then you need to go out, look at other sources of information. And, you know, with your skill sets that you're teaching, go through those sources of information to see what you can then take on board in your own practice and then deliver. And that's not something you're going to get taught on a PT course. I don't even yeah. think that's something you're going to get taught in a sports science. Maybe you will on a sports science degree, but a lot of, you know, CSCS or even um, UKSCA, I don't think they're going to teach you what you can learn on navigating the gray area. So if you're listening to this and there's any question marks popping up for you, I would say that is the sign to sign up which brings me to how do people do that Dave if they want to jump on the next intake um, how would they go about doing that yeah well first of all thank you I appreciate that it's, it's I almost sort of sit there sort of grinning like a book because I don't really know how to take it because it's a bit of a labor of love writing this thing in the first place so it's nice nice to hear that it's had that impact on people but um yeah, if people want to do the course, the easiest way to get me, depressingly, is probably through Instagram. That's where most of the people have signed up is through uh, direct message. I'm at foundations underscore performance. Um, otherwise, email um, dave.foundations at gmail.com. Um, 
you can there will eventually be a sign up page on my website i haven't been through a whole thing trying to get that updated and just haven't pulled my finger out yet but um that's foundations hyphen pt um dot co uk so any of those but instagram is probably the easiest way to to contact me um and just to talk a little bit about the discord so the some people were asking me like oh is it a course that finishes and then you can't have any of the other recordings and all of this like you never lose access to the discord so my plan is to slowly build the discord server up as long as it'll let me to have different rooms um, i might eventually have to get rid of some of the earlier rooms in which case i'll warn people but um there's going to be a central room that will never change so that everyone who signs up will have the ability to contact everyone else if they wanted to because i want to kind of build this into a little community where i can share some of the stuff as i go so as i've improved on the second intake um i've been trying to share some of that stuff with you guys on the first intake as well so that you're aware of it um and just sort of go from there because it's will keeps badgering me saying that i'm not charging enough for what i'm doing and you're not but well you can get to that and, and, I, and i'm sure it will increase in time and that's but i've made the people i've told i'm like you want to get on this sharpish because it's it's you like you're saying it's going to evolve and it's going to improve and it's going to get fucking popular I, I can feel it and so you're gonna it's gonna hike by just the result of you know more more demand but you know, yeah. get on it and get on it now people i tell you <laughs> um but I also want it to be accessible because I think if you're a yep. young coach, you're not necessarily making a lot of money. No, totally true. And you often, a CPD can be something that you push a little bit down your budget. So I wanted to make sure it was something that people could afford early on. Yeah, um, which is really gracious of you. And it is totally affordable. And man, Jesus, what you get for that money is ridiculous in terms of a cornerstone skill set if you are a coach or physio or PT. So yeah, I mean, props to you for making it. And, you know, oh, worth you. mentioning, there's a lot of that money, you know, that still goes to charity, right? You're not, you're, you're still you're still working with charities. I don't know if you want to give them a quick quick plug, the guys that you're working with, but I thought that yeah, was so, pretty awesome as well. Um, I, I work with a lot of different charities. I need to do my post this month, actually, but I don't work with them. I donate to them, sorry. And I heard a podcast a couple of years ago with Sam Harris, where he talked to the founder, who's, I think he's a Scottish philosopher anyway um guy who founded the effective altruism movement basically his argument was people want to help in things but they generally don't or they donate in ways there's been a big shift in terms of donation where a lot of people don't donate money anymore and they've become more cynical about it as they found out about how much wastage was happening in large charities so the effective altruism movement was set up to basically do the hard work for you so they're also called giving what we can and effective altruism is a sort of umbrella group where it can do stuff with you about how you can help the world through your career how you can help through donation but if essentially i can donate to them and i know the money's going to good places and they evaluate the, the charities on a, a quarterly basis to make sure that they're still donating like one of the simplest uh, equations that they do is number of lives saved to amount of money given so like a, a really solid one is mosquito nets in africa because that will save the most lives for the least amount of money um and something he talked about was one almost everyone can afford to donate 10 percent of their income i appreciate with the changes in um cost of living that's probably slightly less accurate than it was in the uk but I haven't noticed a huge difference doing that. It, it's it's enough that I go, oh, right, would it be a little bit easier if I didn't do this? But at the same time, what am I going to spend it on? Probably some shit I don't need. So I'd rather give it to someone else. Um, and I try and help some local charities as well, because the other thing that the guy said on this podcast was um, Sam asked him, like, should you, is there anything wrong with not donating in that way? And he said, no, you need to do a bit of donation to something that, is personal to you as well because otherwise it can all be all very detached so i like to try and do something local and then something to effective altruism or one of their funds um, but that's across my whole business so essentially 10 percent of my once i've worked out my wage 10 percent of my wage after tax goes to that each month and i share that with my clients but that's why i also share it with guys who, and the girls who do the course so yeah. that they know where that money went as well yeah, um, I think it's fantastic, mate. I was, I was, uh, I was impressed by that. I think that's a great, just little addition to an already 
brilliant course. Um, it's five stars from me. I think everyone should get on it. Um, I'm hoping you're going to get an influx. How many places is the course limited to September intake? I haven't got a limit at the moment, which sounds oh, awful, but I, uh, okay. I would, Good. I, I think being a classroom teacher, it probably blows uh, in my head. I'm like, ah, I could teach 30 people. That's easy. Realistically, I think if it got to 15, I'd probably think about starting to limit it there. I, I think maybe 15 to 20 would be the, the, the maximum I do for two months, but I do run it every nine weeks at the moment. So it's essentially okay. eight week, one week off, off we go again. Yeah, nice. Okay, um, well, as of yesterday, there are at least 28 downloads on the last podcast. So you, <laughs> hopefully there'll be a waiting list for you, mate. And uh, yeah, I think everyone should get on it. So um, yeah, last time then, Dave, if people want to contact you for S&C stuff or if they want to book onto the course, uh, Instagram handle is? Uh, foundations underscore performance fantastic right so i'll chuck that in the show notes and stuff anyway and there'll all be hot links for all that stuff um yeah wow. thank you mate yeah i'm just looking pleasure. if i got any questions but i, I didn't all these people looking and none of them put a question in yeah well i hope hopefully we've answered them mate and you know if you guys <laughs> listening have got questions and stuff still chuck them in and we'll, we'll we'll figure out a way to answer them whether it's online or doing another show down the line or whatever it is but Mate, this has been a fantastic chat. I mean, we nearly crushed out two hours there. I hope it's been insightful for everyone listening a, a bit deeper on what the course entails because that was a, sort of our goal going into this. And I think you've done a, a really good job there just explaining even just the contents and just how it's structured. Um, yeah, people listening, get on that. Um, thanks very much, Dave. Let's get you on That's soon. Right. And uh, you. yeah, enjoy running the, the courses again and evolving them as they go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I'm glad that you got so much from the course because ultimately that was why I wrote it in the first place. Yeah, 100%, mate. All right, we'll catch you next time. All right, cheers.